All right, everybody, welcome to part two of World War II. Now, if you remember in part one, we left off with Britain and France declaring war on Germany. Germany had just invaded Poland with help from the Soviets, and so Britain and France no longer have a choice. They have to declare war on Germany. So we're going to get started. We're going to take a look at World War II. We're going to start off by looking at Benito Mussolini and then go into the rest of World War II, what happened and how it ended. Now just remember, this is an overview. This would be an hour-long video if we got into all the details of it, but for a lot of middle school students, they don't really know anything about World War II, so we're going over an outline of World War II. In high school, you'll get the details, more of the details of World War II, okay? So let's go ahead and get started. Benito Mussolini. Now Benito, uh, Benito Mussolini, he is the dictator of Italy. Now one of the things I want you to notice as we go through his information, he has a lot of parallels with Adolf Hitler and how he came to power, what his life was like in some ways before. So he founded the Fascist Party of Italy. You know, Adolf Hitler became the leader. He didn't found the Nazi party, but he became the leader of the Nazis. In 1921, Mussolini is elected to parliament. Mussolini was later made prime minister. Now, his rise, and by the way, I'm skipping a lot of details, but just like Adolf Hitler, Adolf Hitler in 1920 became the leader of the Nazi party. And Benito Mussolini's fascist party, by the way, Nazism is just fascism. They just call it Nazism, National Socialism, but it's the same thing. So both of these guys take over their fascist parties. They grow them in popularity. You know, a lot of the people see in the country see them as understanding the common person and working for the common person and they grow in popularity and eventually they're elected to parliament. Now just like Adolf Hitler, Mussolini did not get over 50% of the vote. He didn't win a majority, but he won a plurality of the vote. And then once he won a plurality of the vote, even though the other parties could have come together to stop him, they're too busy fighting amongst each other. And so what ends up happening is eventually, in order to try to calm things down, just like Hitler was made chancellor, Mussolini is made prime minister. But then, after he's made prime minister, there's no more elections. He becomes the dictator. All right? Italy enters World War II in 1939. There's an old saying when it comes to fascism slash totalitarianism. If you remember, that's a government system that takes over everything and there's no freedom. And communism slash socialism. That's where the government runs all the businesses, owns all the businesses, and determines what can be sold and how much can be produced. Whether we're talking about fascism or whether we're talking about communism slash socialism, there's an old rule. You can vote your way into them, but you end up having to shoot your way back out. In other words, these guys are really good, Adolf Hitler and Mussolini. They get voted in, but then once they get voted in, you can't get rid of them. And so you end up having to, like World War II, you have to shoot your way back out once socialism or fascism is embraced. So we see that with Mussolini. He's elected, he's made prime minister, then after that, no more elections. All right, World War II. Let's jump back, let's take a look now that World War II has started. What's happened? Well, Germany, Germany is just running through everybody. That blitzkrieg, lightning war, where they just overwhelm another country's forces and just easily defeat them, that's what they're doing. They invade Norway and Denmark, April 9th, 1940. No, easy. They completely beat them. It's not a problem. Belgium and the Netherlands, same thing. May 10th, 1940, they sweep into Belgium and the Netherlands, absolutely just wipe them, just wipe them away. I don't mean literally that there's no more Belgium and the Netherlands, but they just wipe their armies away. It's easy for Germany. Now, most people are expecting France to be a tougher test. Nope, Germany crushes France on June, by June uh, 14th. Now, if you've ever heard any jokes about France where people go, oh, the French never fight, the French are terrible at fighting, it comes from World War II. Because if you remember, in World War I, the French held the line. Remember for three years, we talked about war of attrition, outside of Paris, the British help the French, but the British and the French together hold that line and the Germans can't break through? Well, that's what people were expecting. Okay, man, the rest of Europe has been taken over, but the French, the French are going to hold out. Well, whatever happened in those 20 years between 
uh, the Netherlands, sorry, the Netherlands, between World War I and World War II, the French were just crushed, wiped out. By the way, here's pictures of German soldiers marching through Paris. There's the Arc de Triomphe. There's the Eiffel Tower. So here's a map, and I really want you to pay close attention to this map. Anything that's in blue or light blue, that's controlled by the Nazis or the Italians, the fascists in Italy. You notice that map there? Almost all of Europe seems to be under control of the Nazis or the, fa the Nazis in Germany or the fascists in Italy. Okay, that's a problem. You have the Soviet Union who's already made a deal with Germany basically saying, hey, do whatever you want. The only thing left is the United Kingdom. Okay, Great Britain at the time. Uh, I was about to say, you got Iceland up there, but all right, nobody, I, Germans aren't worried about Iceland. So this is the last hope right now for Europe. If the countries are in white, Sweden, Switzerland, Spain, Portugal, that just means they're neutral. So they're saying, hey, we're not on anybody's side, we're completely out of this war. So the only thing really left is Britain. And so Germany is going to come in. Their first goal is to try to destroy Britain's air force, but it doesn't work. You know, Britain has a really good air force, and their air force is able to fight back. And so from that point, we're going to see this, the Blitz, the Battle of Britain, September 7th, 1940 through May 11th, 1941. Basically, the Germans are going to figure, well, since we can't take out their air force, what we're going to do is we're going to bomb the cities in England. We're just going to bomb them until the people give up and surrender. And so that's what they do from September 7th, 1940 to May 11th, 1941. They bomb London. If any of you guys have ever seen The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, which, by the way, it's an excellent movie. If you guys have ever seen that movie, it starts out with the kids in London, in London being bombed and them having to run to a bomb shelter. Okay, that's during the Blitz. All right, though, by the way, if you don't remember Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the Narnia movie. If you remember that, the first movie in that series, the kids, they run to a bomb shelter. Right? That's the Blitz. London and other cities were bombed by German aircraft. RAF, okay, that's the Royal Air Force. RAF fighters inflicted heavy damage on German aircraft. That's why they resorted to trying to bomb London. And by the way, not just London, but every major city. So Liverpool, Sheffield, Birmingham, those are all major cities in England. Britain refused to give in. The Germans ended up giving up. So the British are able to hold the line. People's resolve actually in, uh, in London, talking about the capital, and also throughout England, people, instead of giving up, they're like, no, actually, you know what? We're, going, we're, not, we're never going to give up. So the bombing, in some ways, had the opposite effect. The bombing was very deadly. 43,000 people lost their lives. But people wouldn't give up. And instead of breaking the spirit of the British people, the, the spirit of the British people was strengthened, and they were able to overcome the Germans. So the Germans end up stopping May 11th, 1941, and deciding to go with their next plan. They're leaving the Britain alone for now. But instead, they're going to go with their next plan, which is to attack the Soviet Union. Now, if you're asking me, by the way, here's some pictures. This is Winston Churchill, who was prime minister. Uh, during World War II, he stayed in London during the Blitz and didn't leave, and that gave a lot of strength to the people because the leader of their country refused to abandon the city of London. And you can see here's a picture of a bomb shelter that you might have to go into if this is in your backyard. So these would be dug in your backyard if you had a backyard. By the way, if you were in, let's say, London, you lived in a flat. A flat is an apartment. If you lived in an apartment, you'd have to go down to the subways if there was bombing. So to try to stay safe, because a subway, sub, means underground. So subways, trains underground, so you'd have to stay in the subway until the bombing had stopped. All right. By the way, you know I'm going fast because I don't want this video to be 30 minutes long. But if you have a question, obviously you can, first of all, pause this video and go back. If you have a question, I'll be on conference, okay? So Operation Barbarossa. This is the Germans' plan to attack the Soviet Union. They, the Germans had always planned to attack the Soviet Union. So the Soviets are thinking, hey, we made an agreement with Germany. Well, let them take Europe. We don't care. Well, the Germans, they are planning to attack the Soviets. They want to take out Leningrad. By the way, it's called St. Petersburg today. 
Moscow, and Stalingrad. Stalingrad is called Volvograd today. So their goal is to take out these three key cities, pretty much just take over Russia. All right, ladies and gentlemen, there is a rule when it comes to invading Russia. If you can't defeat Russia by the time winter hits, leave. And there's a very famous French dictator named Napoleon, if any of you guys know that name. All right, so Napoleon tried to invade Russia. Same thing happened. Easy to beat Russia in spring and summer, but when winter hits, winters are harsh in Russia. And Russians are used to those winters. Other people who aren't from Russia are not used to those winters. And so Napoleon stayed through winter, got defeated. The Germans are going to do the same thing. The Germans are winning through the spring and the summer. You're thinking, all right, looks like the Germans are going to take over, beat the Soviet Union. Then winters, the winter hits and everything turns. And so the Germans end up suffering mass casualties and getting kicked out of Russia. So Germans invade Soviet Union June 22nd, 1941. All right, hey, cool to invade in the summer. But once winter hits, you're supposed to leave. Germans tried to beat them in winter, never gonna happen, All right? Germany also creates their final solution. That final solution is the Holocaust, their final solution to destroy the Jews, All right? So they termed it their final solution. The final solution was, how do we destroy the Jews? I'm going to skip over this for now because the next video is gonna focus on the Holocaust. So. I'm telling you about this because the Holocaust, we're going to see the Holocaust come into full play right around this time, but I'm going to go ahead and we'll go through the details in the next video, all right? The U.S. is now going to enter the war as well. Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor is bombed. Pearl Harbor is a naval base. So it's a naval base in, uh, sorry, in Hawaii. Hawaii is a state in the U.S. The Japanese are going to bomb that naval base because they figure, hey, we want an empire in the Pacific and East Asia, the U.S. borders the Pacific, we figure the U.S. is eventually gonna jump in to fight us, so we'll do a surprise attack. And they killed over 2,000 U.S. soldiers, they crippled a lot of ships, but Japan was not able to cripple U.S. carriers. The U.S. carriers, by the way, a carrier is kinda like a floating airport, right? It's a huge, huge ship, but it's used for planes. Luckily, those carriers were out on maneuvers. And so the U.S. still had their carriers, and they were able to produce more and more ships so that within about two years, they were able to have their fleet back up and ready. But the U.S. is going to enter the war. They're going to declare war on Japan. Germany and Italy will declare war on the U.S. right after that. And so now the U.S. is fully in the war. All right, by the way, if you look in the description box, I have videos linked for the Blitz, so you can see a little bit of what the Blitz was like. So it'll be the, by the way, hats off to the Simple History Channel, uh, Simple History Channel, and also the History Channel, YouTube channel. Those are awesome. That's where all the videos that I'm linking come to. So if you want to stop this, you might want to stop this right now. Look at the Blitz in Britain, all right? Also take a look at the video of Franklin Delano Roosevelt talking about Pearl Harbor. You also see clips about Pearl Harbor, right? So I'm gonna link those videos in the description box. Take a look at them so it's not just me talking and you looking at these notes, but you can see some video and get it, and just look at it from a different angle, all right? That will help you out. All right, so the U.S. is now in the war. Now the Allies, by this point, they're gonna begin winning, 1943, British and American forces defeat Italy and Germany in North Africa. All right, remember we said World War? So British and American forces are able to liberate North Africa and they kick the Germans and Italians out of Africa. The Soviet Union, remember I said, don't attack Russia in winter, bad idea. Soviet Unions defeat the Germans at the Battle of Stalingrad, November 1942. All right, by the way, note those pictures there, lots of nice snow, it's November. Don't attack the Soviet Union in winter. Don't do it, it never works. All right, so now things are trying to turn, but I hope that you're thinking, okay, all right, the fascists, so basically the fascist Italy, Nazi Germany, they're out of Africa. They've been kicked out of Soviet Union. What's left? Oh, the rest of Europe. How do you liberate the rest of Europe? Well, if you're gonna do that, you have to go through France. 
France is a stronghold. If the Allies can get into France and liberate France, Germany borders France. By the way, that's why it's good to know geography. Germany borders France, and they can go into Germany from there. Welcome to D-Day. All right, so how do you land in France? With one of the largest amphibious landings ever. All right, by the way, if you're wondering what does amphibious mean, what's an amphibian? Think about science class. By the way, this is why it's important to know more than just one subject. So think about science class. What's an amphibian? An amphibian is an animal that lives part of its life in the water and then lives part of its life on land. So a frog starts out as a tadpole in the water, it lives in the water, then it develops lungs where it can breathe air, it grows, and becomes a frog that we know, and it can live on land. So an amphibious landing is where you start in the water and then you go on land. D-Day, very bloody, very heroic, it is amazing. You had British, Canadian, and American soldiers by the way, that 156,000, when it says 156,000 American, British, and Canadian forces, that's just the initial wave. There are more hundreds of thousands that are going to come afterwards. But these guys have to storm the beaches of Normandy, France. There are cliffs in the distance that have machine that with have Germans who are manning machine guns firing down into the water as they are trying to, as these soldiers are trying to land on the beach. If you look at the description box below, I've linked a History Channel video. I want you to watch it so you can get an idea about D-Day, okay? So, D-Day happens. You see from this picture, I mean, the amount of air landing crafts, vehicles, it's unbelievable. They're able to take Normandy. They're able to take the beaches at Normandy. And from there, they're able to liberate Normandy and push their way to Paris. But in order to do this, this is a casualty list. 320,000 German casualties. In this case, because it says 30,000 German dead, you know that this means wounded. So 320,000 wounded Germans, 30,000 dead. The Allies, the American, British, and Canadian forces, 230,000 casualties, meaning 230,000 wounded, 45,000 dead. When you're trying to walk through the beach, if you guys have ever been to the beach, once you go in the water, it's kind of hard to just turn back and walk to land fast. But imagine having 60 pounds of equipment on you, walking through the water as bullets are flying all around you from machine guns way off in the distance. And you have to storm an open beach, get to the cliffs, climb up the cliffs, and get rid of those machine guns. Right? That's why so many died. But the Allies won, and that's the key. And by winning, even with this how heavy it uh, cost, uh, in loss of life and wounded men by taking Normandy, France. They then push to Paris and they liberate Paris and then it's on to Germany. All right, Battle of the Bulge. We're going to go pretty quickly through this. This is the last major German offensive. The Germans know that they're losing, so they just throw everything they can in the winter of December 1944 through January 1945. They throw everything they can at American forces. This becomes the bloodiest battle for American soldiers throughout World War II. 19,000 Americans died, 70,000 wounded, just to get into Germany and push to Berlin. But the good news is, the Americans won that battle. And so, now you've got the Soviets, who they're angry, the Soviets are coming in from the east, the Americans and British are coming in from the west, and they are meeting in Berlin. So war in Europe ends. Germany is going to surrender May 8th, 1945. Adolf Hitler commits suicide April 30th, 1945, so about a week before, a little over a week before uh, Germany surrenders. Adolf Hitler did not want to be taken alive by the Soviets or the Americans, so he goes ahead and commits suicide before anyone can capture him. And that ends World War II in the European theater. All right, as I said, seventh grade, we'll talk about the Pacific theater, but that ends World War II in the European theater. I want you to take a look in the module because I will write out what your assignment is for this video, with this video, and I want you to follow that assignment. If you have any questions, join me on conference. Take care, guys.